Well, good morning. It's good to see all of your faces. I was thinking every now and then I'd like to just stand here for a minute, just pause and say nothing and look at all of you. And <laughs> But I know how awkward that might be for maybe for me and maybe for you more so. <laughs> but anyways, I like to see you and it's good to be here. And please just grab your Bible with, I hope you have yours with you this morning. Turn back with me to the Gospel of Mark as we continue to move through this magnificent testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we find ourselves now in chapter 15 and verses 1 to 15. And if I could please ask you to stand, if you're able with me, for the reading of God's Word. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused Jesus of many things. And Pilate again asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered Jesus up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Oh God, we, as we turn to this text, we pray you open the eyes of our hearts wider to see the, um, the glory of this Christ in this text, to see and to know his heart, to be captivated all the more by him, and to be led to deeper faith and hope, reverence for him, especially as we eat communion later this morning. We ask that our hearts would swell with love towards this Jesus who died for us, that we would be reconciled to you. We ask in his name, amen. Well, as we begin the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, a major shift happens. In the second half of chapter 14, Mark told us about how Jesus stood on trial before the Jewish religious authorities. Now in the opening verses of chapter 15, Mark will tell us about how Jesus will stand on trial before the Roman civil authorities. Up to this point, what we've seen is the greatest miscarriage of justice that has ever been committed and ever will be committed on planet Earth. As the sinless Son of God is wrongfully arrested, unfairly tried, and unjustly sentenced to death. Back in Mark 14, we saw that what Jesus experienced with the religious authorities was a kangaroo court. Well, as Jesus stands before the Roman civil authorities, what he will experience is yet another round of the same. As he stands on trial before the Roman governor Pilate, Jesus is unjustly treated at every turn. And this is horrendous. Because Jesus is the king to whom all should bow and to whom all will one day bow. 
And Jesus' kingship will come up repeatedly in our passage. I wonder if you noticed it as I was reading it. In verse 2, Pilate will ask Jesus, Are you the king? Then in verse 12, Pilate will ask, pardon me, verse 9, Pilate will ask the crowd, Do you want me to release for you the king? Then in verse 12, Pilate will ask the crowd, What then shall I do with the man you call the king? Repeatedly, Jesus is called the king. But the problem is that nobody in the courtroom can see he's the king. Nobody believes Jesus is the king in this room, this courtroom, and nobody bows down to pay homage to him as the king as they should. Instead, what do they do? They falsely accuse the king. They reject the king. They hate the king. The title of this sermon is The King is Tried by Another Kangaroo Court. And this message will have five main points. The first I'm calling The King is Transferred. We see this in verse 1. Having been tried by Jewish religious authorities, Jesus is now transferred to Roman civil authorities, now to be tried by them. Look at verse 1 with me. Mark now writes, And as soon as it was morning... The chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and they led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. So we know that after Jesus and his apostles ate the Passover meal in the upper room, they went out of Jerusalem to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was very late at night when an armed delegation commissioned by the Sanhedrin, the highest court of the Jews, entered that garden and arrested Jesus. And we also know that from between midnight to the rising of the sun, Jesus then stood on trial before Annas, the former high priest. Then he stood trial before Caiaphas, the current high priest, along with the whole Sanhedrin, the highest judicial court of the Jews. Now in verse 1, Mark tells us that it's morning. And he informs us that the Sanhedrin, led by the chief priests, hold a, a consultation. A number of Bible scholars think Mark is referring to the, the conclusion of the trial in Mark chapter 14. But another possibility is Mark is referring to yet a third phase of Jesus' trial. But really, it hardly matters. What does matter is that the most powerful and influential leaders of the Jews, the highest legislative and judicial body within the province of Judea, has been working very hard and very quickly all night to see to it that Jesus is put to death. They cannot stand that he has repeatedly disregarded their religious traditions, that he has rebuked their hypocrisy, the Jewish leadership cannot stand that multitudes of people have been following this Jesus. And worse, they cannot stand that he has claimed to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, equal with God in power and in authority. And so they've charged Jesus with blasphemy, a sin that they've decided deserves the death penalty. But there's just one problem for them. According to John 18, verse 31, the Romans have not given the Sanhedrin the authority to execute a criminal. Thus, what the Sanhedrin decides to do next is transfer Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, who does have the authority to execute criminals. But there's another problem. The Sanhedrin knows Pilate won't care about a charge of blasphemy. And he will not kill Jesus because of that. So what the Sanhedrin decides is they will tell Pilate Jesus is guilty of claiming to be a rival king. That Pilate will care about. That's treason in the Roman Empire, punishable by death. And so we see that there are people who will do just about anything to, to avoid bowing down to King Jesus. Jesus. 
they will even invent evil about him. The chief priests are inventors of evil. They will not be led by King Jesus. Instead, they lead the king away, and they lead him to Pilate. And this brings us to our second point. I'm calling the king is now tried. We see this in verses 2 to 5. Now Jesus will stand on trial before Pilate. Uh, We don't know his first name, but his middle name is Pontius, and his last name is Pilate. We also know that Pilate was appointed by the Roman emperor Tiberius to rule the imperial province of Judea as its prefect in AD 26, a post that he will hold for 10 years. Now, as I mentioned, the Sanhedrin has told Pilate that Jesus is guilty of claiming to be a rival king. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told that the Sanhedrin says these words to Pilate. Listen to this. Referring to Jesus, they say, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And so do you see, they're accusing Jesus of treason, of sedition. And so then, look at what Pilate asked Jesus in verse 2. Are you the king of the Jews? That's the crux of the matter. Are you the king? And by the way, what is the true answer to this question? We all know Jesus is the king. Not only over all the Jews, but also over all the Gentiles. To Jesus, all will bow down. Back in chapter 11, as Jesus entered Jerusalem riding a donkey, the crowd proclaimed, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Later in chapter 12, Jesus also pointed out in the temple that he is the Lord of King David. Jesus is the greater king. But now what is Jesus' answer to Pilate's question? Look at verse 2. Jesus answers him, You have said so. That's a curious answer, don't you think? Jesus does not say he is not the king. But he does not say unequivocally that he is either. What do you make of that? When I was a little child, I asked my mom a lot of questions. Now that I'm a dad, I know how that feels. (laughs) And I remember sometimes my mom answered by saying, yes and no. That used to drive me crazy. My undeveloped brain could not fathom why she just couldn't say yes or no. Why this middle category of yes and no? Well, I think something like this is going on with Jesus' answer to Pilate. Pilate is asking Jesus if he's the king of the Jews. Well, the answer is no, in the sense that he is not a rival to Pilate, Herod, or Caesar. He has not come to fight against Rome with the sword and to free the Jews from Roman occupation. But the answer is also yes. In the sense that Jesus is the supreme ruler, not only over the Jews, but over all the Gentiles and over all the earth and the universe. And I think this is why Jesus says, you have said so. In other words, Pilate, you're correct. But not in the way you're thinking. In the Gospel of John, we're told that Jesus actually explains this to Pilate. He says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. And as for Pilate, he understands enough that he will rightly conclude Jesus is not guilty of treason. But Pilate does not see in what other sense Jesus is the king. If Pilate could see, you know what he would do right now? He would bow down and worship Jesus the king. 
And so Pilate can't understand in what sense Jesus is the king. He's like most people in this world who are neither able nor willing to worship Jesus as the king. Now keep in mind that the chief priests are in the court with Pilate. They're bloodthirsty. They won't let this die until Jesus dies. So look at what Mark writes next in verse 3. And the chief priests accused him, Jesus, of many things. And Pilate again asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. Mark doesn't tell us what the accusations are. Probably as before, they falsely accuse Jesus of threatening to destroy the Jerusalem temple. They falsely accuse Jesus of blasphemy because he has said that he is the Christ, the Son of God. They falsely accuse Jesus of being an enemy of Caesar, guilty of sedition. The chief priests, they want Pilate to be convinced that Jesus is an enemy of the state and that therefore, if he doesn't get rid of Jesus, chaos will ensue and Pilate is going to get in serious trouble with the emperor, his boss. And now, much to Pilate's utter amazement, Jesus refused to say, refuses to say anything else. In verse 5, he remains silent. Why is that? From this point on, in fact, until he dies on the cross, Jesus will not say anything else except what he says to God the Father. He is done speaking to humanity at this point. Why is that? Jesus has said everything that humanity needs to know to make a right decision about him. There's nothing more to be said at this point. He has said plainly in the Gospels that he is the Lord, he is the Christ, he is the Son of God, he is the Savior. What more needs to be said? Another reason I think Jesus is done talking is he's not trying to escape death. He will quietly submit to unjust punishment. And why? To save those who are actually guilty of treason against him, you and me. So look at what happens next after Pilate's interrogation of Jesus this brings us to our third point I'm calling the king is traded. We see this in verses 6 to 11. We know, by the way, from the gospel of Luke that at this point, Pilate sends Jesus to Herod to stand trial before him and that Herod then sends Jesus back to Pilate. Mark doesn't tell us this. He just fa fast forwards to that point where um, Pilate has received Jesus back from Herod. So look what happens next. Picking up in verse 6, Mark writes, now, as, now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. It means son of father, son of the father. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. So let's pause here and notice with me a few things. The first thing we must observe is that Pilate knows Jesus is not guilty of a capital offense. He knows. In verse 10, Mark tells us Pilate knows the chief priests are up to no good. Not only do the chief priests not want to worship and serve Jesus, but you know, they also, they want everyone to worship and serve them instead. The chief priests are envious of the fame and authority and power of Jesus. They want that fame, that authority, and that power for themselves. That's what they want. And how sad and terrible that is. How sad and terrible it is when a person acts religious 
But it's all about him, not God, and how terrible and sad it is when unbelievers pick up on it. They smell the stench of that hypocrisy. But there's a second thing we must observe, which is this. Knowing that Jesus is innocent of a capital offense, Pilate tries to set Jesus free. And it seems to him in this moment during the Jewish Passover feast that there is this excellent opportunity for him to make this happen. As it turns out, the Jews have this custom or this tradition, seemingly weird for us, but here it is nonetheless, this tradition with their Roman government in Judea. And the custom is that every Passover, the Roman government releases from prison one of the Jewish inmates. Now, we don't know how this came about or why, but what we do know is the Roman governing officials, including Pilate, were always sort of walking on eggshells with the Jews. The Jews hated being ruled by the pagan Romans, and rightfully so. And during the Passover, which commemorated the Jews' emancipation from slavery to the Egyptians, many of the Jews were dreaming of being emancipated from Roman occupation. And so perhaps the Romans agreed to release a prisoner every Passover away as a way of showing goodwill towards the Jews, and perhaps as a way of um, pacifying them to some degree. But in any case, Pilate figures this is going to be a good opportunity to release the innocent Jesus. He'll just convince the crowd to ask for the release of Jesus this year, and that'll be the end of this annoying kerfuffle with Jesus and the priests. But much to Pilate's surprise and dismay, look at what happens next in verse 11. Mark writes, But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him, Pilate, release for them Barabbas instead. Can you imagine standing in this crowd, seeing this happen? Witnessing this with your own eyes and hearing it with your own ears is absolutely horrendously evil. The chief priests manipulate the crowd of Jews who are there to demand that Pilate release the prisoner Barabbas instead of Jesus. Are you kidding me? As Mark notes back in verse 7, like, unlike the innocent Jesus, Barabbas is in fact a notorious criminal. Unlike Jesus, Barabbas is guilty of murder during some kind of actual rebellion or insurrection. Unlike Jesus, this man should be in prison. And this man should be kept in prison. And according to the Old Testament, this man should actually be put to death for killing someone. But this is the man the chief priests want release instead of Jesus? Why? Well, the chief priests don't perceive Barabbas to be a threat to them. He's evil, and so are they. They'll make good friends. <laughs> really? Who do, the, who do the chief priests think is a threat? Jesus. He's the threat supposedly. And why is Jesus a threat to the chief priests? Well, Jesus calls them out on their sin. Jesus demands that they repent. Jesus calls them out on their hypocrisy. Jesus acts as if he should be worshipped, and he does deserve to be worshipped. And to this very day, for all the same reasons, the proud, the sinful, the unrepentant, all who want to rule their own lives still hate King Jesus. They'd rather be friends of an evil mortal rather than friends with the good, immortal king of glory because he demands to be worshipped and deserves to be worshipped. But Pilate, for his part, he will try again to release Jesus. In fact, in the next few verses, Pilate tries two more times to let Jesus go, but he now faces escalating pressure from an increasingly hostile crowd to sentence Jesus to death. This brings us to our fourth point. I'm calling the king is threatened. Do you see it? In verses 12 to 14, 
Jesus' life is threatened as the crowd, which is quickly becoming a mob, demands that Pilate crucify Jesus. In verse 12, Mark now writes, And Pilate again said to the crowd, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? And but they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Still convinced Jesus is innocent, Pilate tries not only a second time but a third time to release Jesus, but Pilate is failing. And you do know why he's failing. It's because his judicial process is flawed. To determine what to do with Jesus, what does Pilate do? He surveys the crowd. Put up your hands if you think Jesus should be crucified. Let me ask you, when a politician must decide what is lawful versus unlawful, should he base his decision on the results of a public opinion poll? Or when a judge must decide what to do with a supposed criminal, should he survey the citizens to see what the majority thinks and then adjudicate accordingly? God forbid it. And yet, this is what worldly politicians do. And this is what Christian politicians must never do and what Christian citizens must never do or expect. What is true, what is right and just is not determined by a majority. What is true and right and just is declared and revealed by God Almighty. And it's humanity's job to discern who God is and what his will is and to judge accordingly. So Pilate has epically failed to do his job. The job, by the way, God gave to him. And now he faces a hostile mob. What will he do next? This brings us to our last point. I'm calling the king is tortured. We see it in verse 15. There Mark now writes, So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him over to be crucified. Over the last two millennia, there were people, there have been people, who have portrayed Pilate in a positive light. It's been argued that Pilate did everything he could to release Jesus and that Pilate was a mere victim of an impossible situation. But this verse paints a very different picture, does it not? Pilate knows Jesus is innocent. Pilate knows Jesus should be released. Pilate knows the chief priests and the crowd are wrong to trade Jesus for Barabbas, but nevertheless, he releases Barabbas and sentences innocent Jesus to death. And why? Why does Pilate do this? You see it in the verse? He cares just about the crowd, what they think. Because Pilate only cares about Pilate. He is willing even to condemn an innocent man to protect himself from being disfavored by the crowd. He is a self-centered, spineless coward. How could Pilate order the guiltless Jesus to be scourged? Do you know how torturous this will be for Jesus? Jesus will now be stripped and he will be tied to a post and a soldier will strike his back repeatedly with a leather whip woven with bits of bone or metal and the skin of Jesus' back will be ripped to shreds and he will bleed profusely. Others before him did not survive this punishment, this torture. But Jesus will. And it will be only a prelude to his crucifixion. Having been flogged, he'll then be nailed to a cross. 
whereupon he will suffer with every last breath he takes before he finally dies. What, what does this horrendous suffering of Jesus teach us? Let me briefly tell you three things it teaches us as we get ready to eat communion together. First, the suffering of Jesus teaches us how truly ugly our sin is in the eyes of God. You and I were born into this world not like Jesus, but like Barabbas, with all kinds of wickedness in our hearts. Romans 3 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the punishment we deserve is everlasting death. Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. And Jesus' suffering is so terrible because our sin is so terrible. Second, Jesus' suffering teaches you the awesomeness of Jesus' love for you. Jesus willingly endured not only the physical torture, but also the unspeakable spiritual misery of the wrath of God poured on him on the cross in your place for your sins, so that by your simply repenting and believing in Jesus, you have been forgiven and reconciled to God. Like Barabbas, we deserve to die. But just as Barabbas was released and Jesus died instead, we have been released because Jesus died for us in our place. Behold the love of Christ. And third, Jesus' suffering shows us how we must love others. To care for those in your life, you must be willing to deny yourself, to endure discomfort and inconvenience, to turn the other cheek, even lay down your own life if necessary. Earlier to his own apostles, Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And later, Paul the Apostle will say in Ephesians 5, verse 1, to the saints in Ephesus, he said, Walk in love as Christ loved you and gave himself up for you. Behold the love of God. And let us learn from Jesus how to love as he did with his help.